Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Coffee with Craig, where we talk about all things firearms, firearms policy, politics, culture, media, you name it. We're talking about it right here on Coffee with Craig. So please take a moment, like, and share the program so that your friends can know where the conversation is taking place. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube and Facebook and or Facebook, make sure you hit that notification button. Help us to beat the algorithms so that you'll be notified as soon as we go live. You can participate in the live chat as the program is taking place. Let's jump right into today's topic. We all know that the Supreme Court has ruled that the fundamental right to bear arms, that means to possess a firearm uh, for self-defense outside of the home, is a constitutional right. Uh, at, least, at least we so far know it is in the state of New York. Uh, but we also know that there are a number of bans uh, on concealed carry in a bunch of different places, including the state of Maryland. To that end, where we're going to talk about today is uh, parties moving to dismiss uh, Maryland carry ban and a lo the lawsuit that is associated with that and primarily using it, uh, using as the foundation uh, for that case. Uh, obviously, the decision made in New York uh, v. Bruin uh, and to discuss this case and much, much more with us today, we have associate, count associate counsel with the Firearms Policy Coalition, Mr. Bill Sack. Bill, how are we doing today? Hey, Craig. We are well. How are you? Uh, we are doing excellent. We are doing excellent. All right. So a lot of folks are probably wondering. I know they're probably out there. Everyone's out there thinking, um, well, wait, we thought this was all decided. We thought that uh, the New York pistol versus Bruin was it. And, you know, right to bear arms outside the home, yada, yada, yada. What's, what, what, do we, what, what is the significance of this particular case? Right. So the important thing to remember that in the Bruin case, uh, when a case like that comes down, the case only is binding and applies to the parties that are in the case. So in New York State Rifle Pistol v. Bruin, the Supreme Court said that the New York uh, good cause requirement was unconstitutional and that their uh, carry permit regime, which required a special showing um, outside just regular self-defense in order to get a carry permit, was unconstitutional. Now, as you know, Craig, there are a bunch of other states, uh, including Maryland, that had really similar good cause requirements. Um, in Maryland, they called it the good and substantial reason requirement. Now, that requirement is pretty much identical to the New York ban. Um, but the Bruin decision doesn't automatically take that ban out of enforcement. Um, but what it does is that it informs the courts like, hey, this ban's really close. In fact, it's analogous to another ban, the one in New York that was just struck down. So if you guys continue to enforce it, that's likely un unconstitutional. And so that's exactly what we had going on in this case, which was called Call v. Jones. Right. And it's important for folks to understand that that all, all uh, there are a bunch of these cases. All of these cases were actually already in the process, already moving forward before Bruin was act before New York v. Bruin was actually decided. So that's one of the, one of the things is that it's already there. Now, if someone, if a new case, for example, if a new ban were to be put in place right now and a case were to be filed against it, it wouldn't even have to go up through the process because you would just be the the judge supposedly. Uh, at the district court level or at the at the local level would be able to just look at it and say, yeah, no, it, it's unconstitutional based on this right here, right? Well, you'd think so. I mean, we're already seeing all sorts of new uh, new bans and new statutes that are being put in place, uh, like in California uh, with SB 918 and like in New York with the post-Bruin or the Bruin response bill. Uh, that that Hochul signed pretty early on after the Bruin opinion. Um, so you know we know that there's going to be new stuff that comes down that we're going to be that we're going to be challenging. Um, but as so far as the states that have the really close uh, May issue style good cause or justifiable need or good and substantial reason requirements, uh, those are going to be struck down. Uh, they're either going to be court ordered struck down. Uh, or as in the case of what happened here in Maryland, uh, the governor, uh, Larry Hogan, came up 
and said pretty pretty quickly after the Bruin decision came down that he conceded that you know this policy of requiring good and substantial reason is likely unconstitutional under Bruin, and he suspended the enforcement of it effective immediately. All right. So just but just because it's suspended doesn't mean that it's not still in place. And in essence, what this does is then officially removes that law off the books. So because it's suspended um, and the government has now said we are not going to be enforcing this anymore. Uh, basically, what happened in this case is you're right. The case had already been ongoing and had already made it up to the Fourth Circuit. Um, so we filed a joint stipulation. So we agreed along with the state, the state actually agreed with us in this instance, um, that under Bruin, the good and substantial reason, uh, requirement was likely unconstitutional or was unconstitutional under Bruin. Um, however, because the state had formally said, we're not going to enforce it anymore. The case was what's now called moot, which means if there's no longer a live case in controversy. Uh, because the uh, rule that it was that we were going to be challenging and that we were actively challenging is no longer being enforced. So the main thing that we were asking for in the lawsuit, which is this good and substantial reason requirement to go away, is now gone. And so we agreed as as uh, both parties, both the plaintiffs and, and the state in this case, that as long as they are not enforcing that, that we don't need to sue them. Ah, okay. So I get it. So this is basically just saying, okay, yeah, we're we're okay with letting the law. There, there is no more lawsuit because uh, we won. <laughs> yes, this is a win. The, no, no question about it. This is a big win. This, this is what was necessary for the sub good and substantial cause requirement in Maryland to go away. Now, the state of Maryland, in addition to the governor, Governor Hogan, being on the books as saying we're not enforcing this. Uh, now the state in official court filings has said, we are not going to enforce this because we agree that it's unconstitutional under Bruin. Mm -hmm. So now are there, and, and I, cause I know, and you, we see this all the time, whenever we do posts or whenever we post these videos, there are people from certain states who are always like, well, when are you going to sue our state or when are you going to come? So I'm, I'm assuming that on this issue, uh, unless Unless that's if a state already has a law in place that violates uh, that violates the uh, the Bruin decision, uh, unless they already have a law, I'm assuming that there's no real need to go around suing places unless they still have their law in place or unless they introduce laws restricting the right to bear arms uh, following the Bruin decision. Yeah, I mean, and we're seeing both of those. So in the states where they had good cause requirements or justifiable need, justifiable need requirements, in large part, what we're seeing is that they're figuring out a way to remove the enforcement of that requirement, just like they did here in Maryland. New Jersey's doing the same thing. California's doing the same thing. Um, and so they're doing that so that they aren't directly in contravention to or in contradiction, rather, to uh, what the mandates of Bruin set forth. That being said, they're going to try everything else now. So now we're going to see all sorts of additional requirements that they believe, well, okay, if we can't have a May issue good cause requirement, what if we have a good moral char character requirement? What if we require references? What if we require onerous fees or extensive training requirements in areas where that training isn't even available. Um, maybe we'll have an appointment only system where the only way to get an appointment is to set one out three, three years ahead of time. Um, and then we're also seeing restrictions that are going to be coming down and have already started to come down, which are called sensitive places restrictions, which is like, okay, fine. So we have to give you the permit now. Well, guess what? People, even with people with permits now, can't carry on the bus, on the train, in Times Square, in a restaurant, in a sports venue, in the subway, or, you know, anywhere else that's not in their front driveway. Um, and arguing that that falls under the sensitive places exception to concealed carry. Um, so, you know, we're going to be fighting all of those in the courts as well. And uh, we're going to be nice and busy for the next couple of years. Well, okay, so now that's interesting because when, in particular, when you go, you talk about good moral character because a lot of places also have that requirement, and it has generally been, generally in a broad sense, been 
you know, as long as you can pass a background check. Um, and in other places it's been, well, okay, well, depending on, even if, you know, if you've had arrests, what have those arrests been for, yada, yada, yada. I'm assuming that in some places they're gonna try and make it a lot stricter, like requiring you to give up your social media so they can check out and see what you posted yep. on your social media. Uh, they're gonna require character references from people. Um, but the, the problem with that is, is that in the end, because there is no real definition, it's incredibly subjective, uh, which falls, which is going to create some of the same exact issues or problems that we saw with right. Uh, good cause, right? Right. I mean, one of the things that the court addressed in Bruin was that one of the, the major problems with these good cause standards is that they are based, they basically provide unilateral discretion for the issuing agency to say yes or no based on a whim. You know, you get it because we say so, you don't get it because we say so without any objective tests. And good moral character is often very similar. Um, now, in the areas that do have a somewhat objective test associated with good moral character, like you were talking about, Craig, you know, where they look for prior arrests, maybe some sort of criminal conduct that's non-prohibiting, but raises some sort of concern, um, whether that's reasonable or not. Uh, is certainly debatable. Um, but yeah, the expansion of these good moral character requirements to include things like social media, which should raise major red flags for anybody listening, especially any legal minds listening, um, as a First Amendment violation, uh, the idea that you could post something and have the government say you can't exercise a fundamental right, which is the right to carry your firearm outside the home, because you said something objectionable in the eyes of a sheriff's deputy in the middle of upstate New York is absurd um, and will be ripe for additional constitutional challenges on multiple grounds. Right. Because, you know, it, it's funny if you think about it, you know, I, it, I, I don't know a lot of the background of a lot of the, the concealed carry, the discretion laws when discretion was starting to be allowed. But I know back in, the, I think it's 1923 when it was put in place in California. Interestingly, at the same time, it was the law, a law was put in place that prohibited the sale of firearms and ammunition to Native American. I mean, no, at that time it was the Chinese, Chinese and uh, and Mexicans, what we now refer to as Asian Pacific Islander or Mexican. Uh, earlier in the 1870s, uh, they had already put the restriction in place for at that point Indians, what we now refer to as Native Americans. So I always like to say the gun control period. At least I can I, I could say this. Pretty I, with pretty good solid foundation or belief uh, in California was designed to keep those people from being able to have sure. firearms and ammunition, uh, and that's really what they're looking at here. Is is with discretion, a lot of these municipalities to them, uh, those people has expanded to any of us who are not part of either the law enforcement community or the politically elite. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and I'm sure uh, my esteemed colleague, our director of constitutional studies, Joe Greenlee, can speak about this more eloquently and in greater detail. But the history of gun carriage permitting to begin with has its roots in slavery reconstruction, um, where in, in Reconstruction America, the only individuals in many states that were requir required to have a permit of any kind to carry weapons on them were either currently slaves or were freed slaves, freedmen. Um, so the history of requiring permits at all has has very serious racist underpinnings. <laughs> yes, we all need to take a little bit of time to understand, understand black codes and all of that. Once again, those were all things that were put in place, once again, to keep uh, a particular group of people based in particular on their ethnicity. And to, from being able to own or possess firearms in order to not single them out. They, then they started to use the term discretion because they had faith and believed that law enforcement would, uh, they would know, you know, they would know what they meant. <laughs> well, this is excellent. So what, uh, what, uh, what, where is this exactly in the process? I know that uh, this was issued at the beginning of August. Uh, when exactly are you, should there be final word on whether or not the case is dismissed and done? Um, we would expect it somewhat soon. So it was on the 11th of August uh, that the Fourth Circuit 
uh, granted the the joint stipulation um, and the, well the joint motion rather to vacate and remand with instructions to dismiss. Um, so we would expect that that dismissal should be coming soon once it gets back down to the district level. Excellent. Excellent. Folks, once again, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, do us a favor once again, just let us know where we can find the work uh, that you are doing for, uh, for us, uh, for the Firearms Policy Coalition. Sure thing. So our main website is firearmspolicy.org. That'll take you to our main homepage where you can become a member, you can donate, uh, you can read about all of the important work that we are doing here. Um, if you want to go directly to our legal teams page, you go to fpclaw.org. There you can see uh, all of the important cases that your FPC legal team is involved in on behalf of the people. Um, you can read about uh, any of the cases that we're involved in in their entirety, all of the filings, all of the briefing, um, anything that the generous donations of our members uh, allow us to file are there in full transparency, uh, sorted both chronologically and just recently now geographically. So you can go directly to your area and see what it is we are, in fact, doing for you in your home state. Very nice. Very nice. Sir, once again, thank you so very much for all that you and the, the other attorneys are doing for us there over at FPC Law. Always happy to be here, Craig. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill Sack. All right, folks, look, you, you see the work, you hear the work. We're telling you about the work that is going on. But here's the thing. That work does not do itself. And we, by the way, cannot do it without your support. Now, I know what you're asking. How can you support us? Well, it's real simple. Become a member today. All you got to do is go to joinfpc.org. That's joinfpc.org. Uh, or you can click on the join link in the description of this video and become a member. It is really that simple. Remember, there is no us without you. And you can either be part of the solution or part of the problem. Don't be part of the problem. Become a member today. Also, if you want to support us, all you got to do is go to, guess what? FPCgear.com. That's right. FPCgear.com. It is the place to go to get all of your cool Pro 2A swag. We're talking t-shirts. We're talking hoodies. We're talking coffee mugs. Uh, we've got all sorts of stuff there available for you uh, where you can look real good. And uh, also, by the way, show your support for the Second Amendment. And once again, the best part about it is every dollar that you spend goes right back into the fight for our right to keep and bear arms. So you can support the Second Amendment and you can look good doing it. That's fpcgear.com. All right, that's going to be it for this episode of Coffee with Craig. We very much appreciate you tuning in. We appreciate you liking and sharing the program and encouraging your friends to do the same. Remember, this is a fight for our civil rights. Got to use them or you're going to lose them. You guys take care. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like, and share.